Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Awesome. Great, 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 great. Welcome to this presentation called Gutenberg and the Content Design Opportunity. My name is Jem Rosario. I am a freelance user experience researcher and designer based here in Toronto. And today, I wanted to talk to you about this thing called Gutenberg. And I'm pretty sure that majority of us in this room have heard of this thing called Gutenberg. But today, we are going to start on a, on, a, on a good note, on a note that will level set um, the entirety of the day today. And I'm truly excited to share this, um, to share this presentation with you and kickstart uh, and kickstart our WordCamp for today. So that's my Twitter account over here, okay? And we've, and we've heard Christi, uh, Christine um, share what our um, hashtag for today is. It's the hashtag WCYYZ. I also tend to use hashtag WCTO18. So if you want to add that, that would be very fantastic. I am looking forward to the conversations that we're going to have today. And without further ado, let's begin. It's no secret that Gutenberg is the elephant in the room, okay? It's no secret that Gutenberg is the elephant in the room. On one hand, you've got this legitimate fear of having to learn WordPress all over again, but then on the other, you just have, you know, you just have somebody who is so, like, deathly afraid that Gutenberg will wreck the whole WordPress system quite massively, okay? Now, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this message over here, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go on an aside here, but the the irony is just so stark. The person who posted it calls himself as a white knight, but then starts the comic with actually, okay? and you know what happens when you use actually. And, and anyway, I'm, I'm I'm going off, I'm going off script in here. Okay. Anyway, today I want to reflect with you on how I've been finding the Gutenberg experience and. My focus in here is not really to give you these grand sweeping statements of what Gutenberg is and what it should do for you, but rather I wanted to provide this initial inroad to what Gutenberg is and what it might represent for us as WordPress users and site builders. In the same way that Marshall McLuhan, our very own Marshall McLuhan, used the rear view mirror in order to motivate how we look into the future, I want to use this talk as a starting point for what is possible in a Gutenberg future. And if this is the first time that you're hearing about Gutenberg or just curious about what Gutenberg can do for you, then believe me when I say this, you are in the right place. So here's our agenda for today. I'm going to start with my Gutenberg experiment. Okay? I'm going to uh, tell you an instance where I installed Gutenberg and just took it for a spin. And then we're going to go through, you know, the... We're going to go through the issues, the brouhaha, the meltdown, the hashtag WP drama, the good, the bad, and the ugly about Gutenberg as we know it at this point. And then I'm going to be zeroing in on the content design opportunity that, that Gutenberg offers for us. Okay? Now, I want to be very clear in here. I am not trying to be extremely naive that Gutenberg is going to be all bells and whistles, a bed of roses, and just full of rainbows and unicorns um, um, flying here, there, and everywhere, because there are legitimate issues to, it, to look into. But we want, to, we want to examine what Gutenberg can do for you and what is possible and what it can offer you. And then we're going to wrap it up from there. Sounds good? Okay. All right, perfect. So I won't be covering the nitty-gritty or engineering details of Gutenberg. We've got a very excellent lineup of speakers and experts that will cover just that. My goal in here is to provide you that high-level overview, specifically the authoring user experience and the strategic opportunity that it can give for you. So let's begin with the very first uh, section over here, which is my own Gutenberg experiment. So I maintain this UX blog called Hey Design Thinker, okay? And it's a place where I store all my views and opinions on all things user experience and product design. It's a, you know, I hang my head in shame in here. It's a very sporadically maintained blog, okay? If you go there right now, you will see that the, uh, the first, the, fir uh, the, the last post rather was, was still in September, okay? And my blog activity honestly comes in waves. It starts really very furious and then quiet and then active again, you know, you know the drill. When Gutenberg first started rumbling, I decided to test it out over there on my, on my blog. I mean, I would never ever dare to put Gutenberg on my own um, portfolio site. Like, that's just way too much risk, okay? But having it on the blog seemed like a less risky proposition. And it has been there for about, you know, maybe 10, close to 12 months, okay? 
pretty much close to a year. And when I first installed Gutenberg, I was just astonished. I was saying, ah, Gutenberg is a lot like Medium. Okay, it's a lot like Medium. How many of you use Medium to blog or have read a Medium blog post at some point? Raise your hands. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that you will share my opinion when I say that Medium really feels so clean. It's so airy. It's so full of white space. It has less visible controls, okay? And Gutenberg is precisely that. You're not really seeing that, that Microsoft Word-ish kind of um, treatment in terms of controls um, in front of you um, in, in a Gutenberg in a Gutenberg editor, okay? And in, the, in this editor, the Gutenberg editor, your controls, the ones that you need, they only pop up when you need them, okay? So it's a lot like a very contextual kind of um, editor, a very contextual kind of control. And it's really distraction-free. So if you're one of those people who constantly have to press distraction-free in order to do their own writing, you know, Gutenberg is WordPress's um, best answer to that to date. And I wanted to share with you what Matt Cromwell, a, a plugin developer and the head of support and community outreach at Impress.org, once said when it comes to comparing Gutenberg and Medium. Okay? And he says in here, in recent years, we've seen Medium become the de facto elegant writing experience. Gutenberg has the potential to allow writing to be as elegant as medium, or more so, plus deliver far more flexibility with layouts and content types, okay? And he's quite bullish about this. Now, if you look at his uh, blog, if you, if, you, if you search his blog and you really look for this quote uh, in, uh, online, you will find that he provides a balanced treatment of the good and the bad about Gutenberg. But in general, there is a sense of optimism in here, especially when it comes to authoring and delivering um, content. So let's now go over what this thing called Gutenberg really is. So the biggest new development for, um, for, for WordPress through Gutenberg is this thing called the content block. Okay? And these are your common content elements. They may be your images, your headings, your codes. They used to be short codes okay, if you're using page builders. Okay? And in here, you just simply click on that block. So for example, if you want to use an image, you just click on this, and then it will be deployed on the main editor. So whatever I want to use, whether it is paragraph, click, pop, image, pop, etc., etc., etc. And it has its own style. It has its own way of styling. And also, so suppose that we're going to be working on a paragraph block over here. Okay, you add it. Okay, this box over here that is one block already. Okay. And you can define those blocks characteristics using the block settings panel on the, on the right. Each block is a content unit unto itself with its own characteristics and specifications. And what's really interesting in the Gutenberg world is that the changes that you make, they almost happen in real time. Okay? So for example, if you type, for example, this is a block with some standard text. If you, type, if you click that you want the text to be large, you will immediately really see that the text gets larger. Okay? It's, as Morton Rand Hendrickson would say, it's the truest form of WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And what's also interesting in a Gutenberg universe is that content creation, okay, in a block-driven content creation kind of thing, it's really about putting blocks on top of each other. So as you can see over, over here, you've got an image block, and then they're put, it's, put, it's put on top of a text block. In particular, there are two text blocks in here, this one and that one. Okay? Okay. Each of these blocks can be modified and styled, I would say, using the block settings panel. And what's also interesting is that each of these blocks can be reused throughout the page. So for instance, if I want to use that image block again, okay, this thing over here somewhere in the page, I can just do that. And I will show you specifically how that block duplication thing is possible at a very, uh, at a very um, easier level. So there's really no need to have to rewrite the page. There's no need to go to the code view again and just copy and paste it or something. Not, no, there's not a lot of need for that. You can just click on duplicate and it's gonna show up as another instance either at the top or at the bottom. And I've already mentioned that Gutenberg auto saves posts. This was really fantastic. And I mean, I mean, sure, most of my slides are running on Keynote, but if you've also experienced what it's like to build quote unquote in the cloud, like Google Slides or anything, just the sheer fact that you aren't hitting save pretty much like every single minute or so is a huge time saver. 
And this auto-saving feature in Gutenberg was something really, really special for me. Okay, it shows your changes right there and then on the editor, almost like in real time. And unlike before, unlike before, where you have to either press preview or update just to see your glorious set of changes on another page, with Gutenberg, you're almost seeing your site, your page in front of you as early as the editing panel. Okay? Now, to be sure, the preview button is still available to you. The preview and the update button, they're still available to you. But I hope it's starting to make sense of that immediacy, that feedback loop between you working on that page or post and seeing it before you, that feedback loop is so much shorter now. So much so that, as I have shared with you, Morton Rand Hendrickson says that this is true WYSIWYG. Quote unquote, true WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And again, it's absolutely fascinating for me as a designer how Gutenberg takes care of a lot of UX and accessibility fundamentals straight out of the sidebar. Okay? You know, I'm gonna confess, uh, I'm gonna confess a huge sin in here. One of the things I always forget when I'm putting images is, is alt text. Okay? I always forget putting alt text. And there are many days when I say, ah, oh, I have to put alt text again, and, and I, I forgot this thing. I mean, no, I'm, I'm, not trying to be a, I'm not trying to be a jerk in here, but it's just one of those things that you keep forgetting because it feels like an extra chore. And especially with WordPress, and especially in the, in the previous editor, okay, I'm just gonna call it previous editor from now on, that tiny MC editor. The mere fact that they have to go through a lot more clicks and a lot more panels just to see where I am going to be plugging in that alt text, you know, it, the, tenden the tendency for me is just, okay, I'm going to do it later, but then before you know it, you already forgot it. In Gutenberg, you will almost not really miss it. It's almost unmissable. Why? Because it's right there on the block settings panel. And what's also very fascinating and very important is that it tells you what you can put on. And there have been instances also in which if I put an image, okay, and let's say, for example, the image is of a certain color and I'm putting, I'm putting text on top of it, okay, Gutenberg will actually tell me the text that you are using, the text color, the contrast is not sufficient, okay? So there's almost this very smart quality in which Gutenberg tells you we got to pay attention to accessibility. And, and we're going to try to do something from our end to make sure that those immediate hygienic um, UX and accessibility stuff, they're covered. But of course, it's not without difficulties. For the first time in 10 years that I have been using WordPress, I see this updating failed prompt more often. It's almost as if past a certain point, I don't know, maybe one hour or two hours or something, past some arbitrary point, okay? It will not auto-save anymore. It's just gonna go and go and say updating failed. And, you know, I don't know if this is a server issue or just Gutenberg failing on me, but it seems to resolve if I, you know, purge my cache, close the entire thing, maybe if I'm really feeling so, uh, so mad or something, restart the computer and then, and then fire it up again. But, you know, you know how, you know how disruptive that thing is, okay? It seems, it, it, it does clear up after, um, after doing all those, uh, all those, uh, all those kinds of things. But, by the way, it should just flag that this is a documented Gutenberg issue on GitHub. So, at least I'm happy to know that I am not alone in here. Okay? That's very good to know. Um, I will definitely watch out for that, um, like, Maybe time can be time it if I see if I see it if I if if it if it all works well fantastic if not it's also something for them to look into. But you know that said that said my Gutenberg experience has mostly been positive. Okay, save for that mysterious saving failed issue, the immediacy of the Gutenberg authoring experience has been something quite special and exciting for me as a user. So if that's the case, then. Why does there seem to be a huge brouhaha regarding Gutenberg's arrival? Okay, and it's quite fascinating that there's even uh, there's even a hashtag for it, hashtag WP Drama. And if you go to that if you go to that hashtag on Twitter, you will find that there's just a lot of a sound and fury, or more like fire and fury, regarding Gutenberg. Okay, and I'm just really curious how you know how this kind of sentiment really unfolds in our community. 
So to do that, to really answer and get to you know some sort of idea on why that's happening, I decided to look to do a very tiny thought experiment just to sort you know this issue out. Okay, when it comes to the Gutenberg drama. So I did what uh, what uh, what in business strategy is called SWOT analysis, which is all about the understanding of the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats um, surrounding um, surrounding your your business, your product, or your service. Nothing grand, okay? Nothing too involved. Nothing so uh, nothing so like bells and whistles kind of thing. But just a quick heuristic for me to get thinking about this issue. And let me share with you the things that I came up with that thought experiment. I've been finding really that in terms of strengths, Gutenberg is so good at being immediate. So remember what I said that the feedback loop between you as the as the author of the of the page or the post and you seeing the results in front of you, that feedback loop is much shorter. Okay? And what's even fascinating really is that the author and user experience is much more bubbled to the surface. There's not a lot of need for you to go through multiple panels or overlays. You just see the really crucial things that are important to you. Right, right, pretty much beside you, maybe the right side of the screen. And again, I cannot, I cannot overstate this enough. The fundamentals of user experience and accessibility are upheld at the block settings panel. So there's really no excuses for me, and I'm absolutely really, really thrilled for that. Okay? But then, there's also, there's also the weaknesses that we need to contend with. And I gotta tell you, that term that I'm using here is really just putting it quite nicely. Okay? Apprehension is just putting it very, very diplomatically. And just to demonstrate the extent of emotion regarding Gutenberg, here's an example. Okay? Unless you are a masochist, do not switch to the new WordPress.com Gutenberg editor. Okay? Ooh, very ominous. And, you know, the words, okay, at least for one WordPress user, was just like, my goodness gracious, I feel like I'm gonna go to hell if I switch to Gutenberg. Okay? It's a disaster. You're gonna get stuck. You have no way out. It's garbage. Okay? You're locked in. You have been warned. Okay? But, you know, uh, it's an indication of how some WordPress users feel about Gutenberg. And, you know, I can go on a huge snark trip about this, and I'm pretty sure that my, uh, my attempt at in, in, uh, doing that snark could really raise some ruffles, and maybe some of you would say, how dare you, Jen? You're just downplaying the, the legitimate fears. And I get it. I really, really get it. There are issues that Gutenberg really has to address. But I also wonder, where is this fear truly coming from? And there just seems to be a lot of things holding back when it comes to Gutenberg. And if we really want to entrench Gutenberg, especially as we steer up in a WordPress 5 future, then we will have to answer what these issues are and, you know, try to resolve it. And then you've got the threats. Okay? You've got the threats. This is where the serious stuff really is. You've got fears of broken websites, incompatibility, page builders and consultants going out of business. Okay? And yes, I say yes, I, I, I concur. I can see I can see the I can see the threats in here, okay? Now a little bit of a, a little bit of a colored commentary in here. I I personally can see why page builders, the smaller um, page builders that is, I can see why they can be threatened by Gutenberg. Especially if you consider like Elementor, um, Themeco, um, DV, etc., etc. You know, the, those big names, they have adequate resources to really try to respond to, um, to a Gutenberg future, okay? But we don't really know for sure if a smaller page builder company could really be, could really be um, ready for that, uh, for that big leap, okay? But to say that Gutenberg will effectively and completely end WordPress consulting in all of its forms, okay? I'm not really too sure about that. It seems like going on a stretch. It's like saying that, oh, you went to the Home Depot, I now have a hammer, I can now build a mansion by myself, okay? Without any help, this is just me. I have this hammer. I can build everything already. Now, now, I do have a story to share with you about this. I remember working on a WordPress website a couple of years before, and it was really an accessibility remediation project because the the site that the uh, the former webmaster built was just you know not not it was it was just not really up to standards, and we need to immediately um work on it because AODA was was gonna be um in place. And um, it was built 
on a website builder. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call the the name of the company, but it was built with the website builder. What I'm trying to say in here is that ultimately it's the designer or the developer's design uh, design design decisions. Um, it's really their architectural choices, the way they decide how this entire site is gonna go. It's ultimately dependent on the capacity of the person building the thing rather than just simply the tools that are available to them. So I'm somehow skeptical if Gutenberg will really completely obliterate everything because when you really think about WordPress consulting as we know it, a lot of the consultants are in, are in reassurance mode. And we are all really waiting and seeing how Gutenberg fares in the marketplace so we can prepare for it. And then there's the opportunity that Gutenberg offers. And I'm going to be diving into this as we go through the next few slides. But in, an, but in a nutshell, when we talk about content design, we are really putting a lot of hope on how that block-driven content creation is going to unlock the ability to build smarter, user-centric content. Sounds good? Are we doing so far? Doing pretty great? Amazing. So we've gone through two parts already, and now let's move on to the third, which is the content design opportunity for Gutenberg. So what is this content design opportunity that I'm speaking about? Well, it's a claim about how Gutenberg can help us make smarter content by virtue of its atomic workflow. workflow. By exploding, okay, in particular, by exploding that huge piece of content into tiny blocks, we in WordPress are in a position to treat content as that one discrete, unique entity, okay, just that one block. We're focusing all of our energies in there, and that block can be built, can be reused for other purposes, and we can strategically design and style it to meet our intended communication goals. Okay? There's a lot to unpack in here. Okay? I'm pretty sure that it's starting to sound like it's so philosophical or something. But not to worry. I want you to hang on to the three words that I highlighted in here. Atomic, modular, and strategic. And we're going to be expanding on that idea as we go on in the next few slides so that the argument becomes a lot clearer. All right? So let's begin with the first thing. It's the, call, it's the, at, the atomization of content. So we know already that with Gutenberg, the basic foundational unit is the block. Okay? That one tiny thing, it's the block. It is its founding premise and the main engine, really, for all of this content creation business. It suggests, really, that this tiny thing over here, this paragraph block, this image block, this table block that you're building, okay? it's not just some blob of code. Okay? But it is really content that people interact with on the front end. Okay? And this is important. This is important because I find that when we are building things for our clients, our customers, it's easy to just think, simply think of what we're doing as, you know, oh, we're just cranking out the code and just making sure that it shows up well. But with this kind of atomic workflow, it somehow helps shift your mindset from simply build um, the content block into actually designing the content block. And as I will share with you later, there's a very, very, um, very, refined, uh, very refined idea and sensibility when it comes to saying the word design. And it's not just about making things pretty, but using very smart choices in order to achieve the goals that you wanted to achieve. Crafting it according to specific objectives, so to speak. So for example, Let's look at this button, button block in here in Gutenberg, okay? If you will notice, okay, if you will notice, the person is changing the background and the text color. It's easy to take this thing for granted. It doesn't really seem so controversial, like a very standard operation. But really, when you see it in the live editor, when you see those changes really unfold before you in real time, Man, I gotta tell you, this stuff, okay, this stuff, this content design stuff becomes real. It just becomes really, really absolutely real. Your settings, okay, they cease to be specifications on some big fat document alone, but they become real content decisions that your users will have to live with. So what does this mean for us then, okay? Atomic content then lets you think of content as this unique and definable entity. And you're approaching that content block on, on its, on its individual, individual merits. And more importantly, they're really reusable and scalable. Okay? And the characteristics that we set 
on each content block do have implications on the people who will have to interact with them. So that's really the first um, step in the argument, the atomization of content. And I want you to hang on to that idea that it's just this one tiny thing. And then we're going to be creating a bigger thing out of that. Now let's go on to the second, which is called content modularity. Now I know that the term modularity can, real, can sound like, oh, this is so scary again, another technical jargon or something. But I just want you to hang on to this thing, okay? I want you to hang on to this thing. It's a Lego piece from the dollar store, okay? <laughs> it's a Lego piece, okay? A, co a, collection of, a collection of Lego pieces, okay? But think of Gutenberg and everything that you do, doing, the, doing design and content for it. Think of that in terms of these. Okay? And just try to you know, latch on to this metaphor as we go through, as we go through this entire section. Okay? And sooner or later, you will find that it actually makes sense why Gutenberg, especially, especially um, uh, in the WordPress community, is almost always compared, uh, compared, to, um, compared to Lego. So here's how Nathan Curtis um, defined modularity in his book, Modular Web Design. To be modular, okay, to be modular means you've constructed your components, that is to say, your Gutenberg blocks in this case, so that they are flexible and can be reused. Now, we've seen already in the previous quote uh, with, with, with Matt, I believe, not Matt Mullenweg, okay, but an, an, another Matt, we've seen already that he made that hint about Gutenberg allowing for flexibility. And the idea really of modularity is that you create something once, whether it's a block or an individual component, and then you reuse everywhere. And by the way, just for the designers, for the, for the designers who are in the room, and for, and for majority of us, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with, uh, with material design? Raise your hand. How about the Apple human interface? You can also change the way that the link if you think about the uh, if you think about material design and, and the Apple HIG, okay, the app, the human interface guidelines, have you ever noticed that if you look at your phones, whether it is Android or Apple, they seem to look really, really the same across, you know, regardless of what platform it is. It doesn't matter if it's a phone. It doesn't matter if it's if it's a, if it's a Google Chromebook. They almost always will look the same. And the idea behind that is that there is a design system powering it. And that design system is really made of those individual design blocks, those individual components, where you build that thing once and then reuse it everywhere. Now, sure, you will have to make those, um, those front-end decisions, okay, whether it should be yellow or red or something. But the point is the main engine, the main specification, it's consistent and applicable wherever it is on the page. You create it once and then you reuse it everywhere. So how does this work in Gutenberg? Okay, how does this work in Gutenberg? Well, blocks can be reused and moved around in Gutenberg. And we can see here specific instances of how that happens. So, for example, if you want to reuse something on Gutenberg, you just click on this um, three-dotted panel and it's it there, duplicate. And then it's gonna, poop, there's another instance of that image block available for you. And then when I say you move it around, okay, it's here those up and down arrows. Now, remember how in the previous editor, if you ever wanted to move something up or down, you may have to um, either move the short code or the, or the complete thing, copy it. Like highlight which question has it. That's what Gutenberg tries to solve. You don't really need to do that copy and pasting thing too much. At least if your goal is to move that paragraph block or image block or table block, um, upward or downward, you can just, you know, you can just do so with these, um, with these, with these controls, and then it's available to you. Okay, while, okay, while retaining all of its specific characteristics in block settings. This is important. Okay? This is very important because this sets the stage for what content folks called structured content. That is to say, it's a way of building content that has order and a system to it, specifically according to stated um, stated needs and i've given an example over here of a content model and if you look at the at the content model in here you see here um, a certain type of uh, certain type of order or specification of what that that content type really has to contain and that kind of structuration of content is something that could be very well explicit and more available to you 
um, in, a, in, in a Gutenberg universe. I mean, we're going to expand on this later, but I hope it's becoming clear, really, that Gutenberg is ter Gutenberg's turning everything into blocks can already help you make some high-level decisions towards the content that you are building. And they're specifically playing in the, in the blocks um, that you are going to be selecting and implementing in the page. So that's the content modularity piece, and now we're going to go through the final stage in the argument, which is the content design opportunity. So we've gone through a lot already. We've started with this first thing, which is you've got a block. It's this discrete entity that you're going to be defining and probably reusing it throughout the page. And then you've got modularity where you can move it around and maybe scale it for, to, to build something bigger. And then the third one, this content design thing, this is where it all starts to fit together. And it's really all about the strategic, it's about implementing that strategic vision that you've got and start executing them at the page level, courtesy of Gutenberg. Now, okay, let me call my bias here, out here, okay? I am very bullish about Gutenberg because it facilitates what Sarah Richards calls content design, okay? Now, think about it, okay? Think about it. If you look at this content model over here, okay? How did people possibly arrive at that content structure? Okay? There's got to be a reason why somebody out there said, oh, this website needs to have these kinds of things or these kinds of characteristics. Okay? The short answer really is content design. And when we talk about content design, it's really that very mindful and strategic approach towards creating content pieces right down to the granular level. And here's a quote from the person who really started it all, okay? This content design thing and what it stands for our world today. And I quote, Content design is a way of thinking. It's about using data and evidence to give the audience what they need at the time they need it, using the language they use, and in a way they expect. Okay? What they need, when they need it, in a language they use, and in a way they expect. That last bit over there, that's really the content creator's mandate. That way, that way they expect. So in other words, we're really not just about the front end alone. It's not how about how it looks simply, but also something even prior. It's also about the thinking and the strategy that goes behind it. And so in a very short TLDR kind of thing, this content design process is really something that's profoundly user-centered. And with Gutenberg, it's just much more bubbled to the surface now. Okay? Those settings that you, that you specify in there, make no mistake, in a very smart content creation kind of thing, you are constantly referencing back to what your users need from you. And then you are using your Gutenberg blocks to really make that smart decision on what that page or post is really gonna look like eventually. Here's another example. Okay. I've already hinted at this a while ago, but remember how blocks can be moved around in Gutenberg? Okay. So yes, it's much more convenient now because you push it up or push it down. But I also wanted to share with you something here. That sheer act of you pushing the, pushing the block up or down, okay, that's actually content design in practice because, because you are essentially determining the priority of that same content block in terms of what will really be, you know, what will really matter to the people that I am talking to, okay, and then is this thing really going to be of value at the top or at the bottom? So with the Gutenberg block-driven kind of thing, you will have the opportunity to really say, okay, should this, should this table block really be a table block or should it be another way? I mean, one very practical demonstration of content design is we know that, we, we know that you know, when it comes to giving directions, sometimes the tendency is to show a map. But what if the map cannot really be accessed by someone who, you know, someone who has accessibility needs, for instance, okay? So... Is there any other way to serve that kind of information as well? That kind of strategic and very stepwise and smart approach to bu de building and delivering content, that's really what content design is, okay? And so, every time I'm on my blog, I just have to say that 
it's not really such a far far stretch to say that with Gutenberg you really have the power to determine content strength in your page okay I mean I always laugh whenever I see this scene at Bruce Almighty but you know you really have the power to say okay this thing over here is gonna stay there and it's really gonna stay there but or maybe after a couple of days no no no, no it's not it, does, it doesn't work there maybe it should go somewhere there oh no this map has to be changed it has to be another kind of thing okay that's the power that's available to you in a block-driven uh, Gutenberg universe. So the point then is this. The point then is this. Every Gutenberg block that is available to you is a content design decision. The blocks that we use within that page, all of them work to help you achieve a communication goal. And the question for us WordPress folk then is this. How will you use those blocks to create content that is useful and beneficial to the people that you are designing for? We now have the tools in a Gutenberg universe to make our vision come to life. How are we going to use it to make it really absolutely real? So how does this look in practical terms? Okay, Well, it starts by being clear about what content design is and what it can do for you. So. As we've seen already a while ago, it's about being clear about what people need from you, when they need it, in the language they use, and in a way they expect. And again, as we've seen a while ago already, that last bit, in a way they expect, this is where Gutenberg can really be of help to you. Those blocks, they are really your tools to effectively design content according to your users' needs. And I want you to use them to drive a winning page or post design or wherever your content decisions could end up in, whether it is on a desktop screen or a mobile screen or a watch or something. Okay? And I'm going to be sharing with you some resources on how that really can happen in a much more scalable, uh, scalable fashion. So for instance, okay, here are some high-level questions that you may want to ask yourself when you are trying to build content for your, um, for your clients or your customers. Okay? And if you take a look, at the questions that I've got over here for you, okay? I want you to notice something in here. Notice that I am asking you more strategic questions than tactical questions. I'm not really asking you to determine at this point yet, okay, what block should you use in that section, in that page. But we're talking about something a little bit more meta than that, okay? More high level. Friends, this is the craft of content design. It's about making these smart choices when it comes to content so you can create something that is of value to the people who will be using it. And with Gutenberg making these decision points explicit, I truly feel very optimistic about the future of content creation within our beloved WordPress system. So to cap all of these uh, um, Gutenberg ideas together, at the end of the day, Gutenberg is really all about componentized content creation. By exploding content into those tiny individual blocks whose settings we can explicitly set, we are in a better position now more than ever to clearly define a content or a block's characteristics and build it in a way that is both user-centric and smarter for all people involved. It is a tool in your WordPress arsenal to realize the content design imperative, which is to build content out of user needs and in a form and manner that's suitable to them. At this point, there are just too, there's just too many unknowns in Gutenberg for us to say something with absolute certainty at this moment. Okay? We still do not know how this is going to go. Like, uh, I remember that the I remember that the biggest uh, the biggest WordPress push happened just a couple of weeks ago, November 19 or November 20. That is specifically something that um, that uh, that that uh, that concerns Gutenberg. And really, we are still at the early days of of uh, maybe WordPress 5 and Gutenberg really being a being a thing. And I'm not trying to downplay by any stretch of the imagination, the legitimate concerns and issues that Gutenberg has. And we have to constantly work very hard to make sure that the system that is, you know, that is really um, giving a lot of uh, joys and pains for us at this point is something that we can all get behind with. But despite all the sound and the fury that you may be hearing, I hope you will promise me this. 
that you will let Gutenberg help you do content design. Okay? Promise me this, that you will let Gutenberg help you do content design so that you can create content that is in a more efficient, in a more reusable, and in a much user-centered manner. Thank you. So I'm quite surprised that I breezed through this presentation in about 40 minutes, okay? The, uh, the slides are over here, okay? It's bit.ly slash Gutenberg TO. Um, feel, please let me know if you, are seeing, uh, if you are seeing the page as it should show because I am running into 403 issues sometimes, okay? And that's why I probably have to head to the happiness bar just to get this thing sorted out. Okay, but here's, my, but here's the slides over there. That's my Twitter account. That's also my email. I am really excited to, uh, to share the day with you. Are there any questions? Yes. It's it, a, a lot really has to do with how Gutenberg is just going to... Oh, okay. Uh, so, the, so the question is, um, what, what, why is it that Gutenberg has such bad reviews as opposed to, for example, um, Beaver Builder, Elementor, etc., etc.? Is that correct? Okay. My understanding really is that, aside from what we've heard already, which is um, it's just not ready, okay? It's just not ready. I really think that the biggest issue with Gutenberg at this point is coming from a more engineering standpoint. And I've noticed that the, 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 most, uh, the, the most fiercest criticism regarding Gutenberg is coming from the, devel from the developer community, not necessarily from us in the design community. I mean, for us as designers, like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a lot like Medium, and, and, and it's just componentized. And again, um, Component-driven design is not really a new thing for us, but but when it comes to really implementing it um, on the road, it, it it does run into issues. So, um, I'll I'll say that it's starting from an engineering standpoint. There are legitimate fears that uh, the incompatibility of websites are just is just really almost a, a hard hurdle to um, to get past with. Um, it's, it's, it has a lot to do with the code. I mean, I'm not a super expert in development, but that's where I really see the core of the issue coming from. And if there's anybody in the audience who could also um, shed light on that, um, please feel free to jump right in. If you have a question, come on down here so we can hear you and record you on the video. Anybody else? Yes. So, so the question is, I'm going to repeat it so everyone hears it. Did everyone hear that? No. no. Uh, the question is, why are page builders not meeting the requirements of accessibility, WYSIWYG editing, what else, Jack? Uh, WYSIWYG editing and reuse. And reuse. OK. Um, I'm going to speak. As a, as, a, as a site builder myself, okay? personally, part of the reason why uh, I, f I feel like it's just really a challenge is because a lot of these things, you know, the reuse, the, um, the, the accessibility thing, the, the worry that I usually have is they tend to be an afterthought. Like, sure, when I build these things, I always say I, I have to make sure that I run a color contrast analyzer on this, etc., etc. But but there's so many things going on in the background already that I end up forgetting them um, in, uh, um, uh, over there. And what I think Gutenberg is really good at at this point is that it calls out those hygienic, uh, hygienic decisions um, explicitly and immediately to you at this point. And, and for me, for me this, is, uh, this, is something to, uh, this is something to look forward to. Now, that being said, I would also, uh, I would also say that if, uh, if, if a page builder can be capable of, of delivering those immediate hygienic decisions um, without you forgetting it, that would be really a very great development. So for now, my answer as, as, as an individual site builder is that they can really be an afterthought. And before you know it, you just completely forgot to put that alt text or... or, or Make sure that the text that you use on that on that image is has sufficient contrast. Uh, Jim, what you're saying is, is that uh, hygienically, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're saying that 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 you're saying
in current page builders, you can do, uh, and you will see exactly what the page will look like. Unlike in the case of, of Gutenberg, which doesn't, you get surprises as to how it will look when you do the preview. It's not the same as what you see on the screen as you're developing. Mm -hmm. So WiseyWig appears to be in the page builder mm -hmm. And likewise, the same situation applies in terms of reuse. Uh, reuse in terms of... Oh, okay, so let Jen answer that. Okay, uh, my view towards that is that, um, is that I, I, maybe your experience is different, but what I have noticed is that in terms of immediacy, that feedback loop is just a lot shorter. Now, to be, that said, the preview and the update buttons are still there. But what I have noticed is that if I am going to be styling my page immediately with Gutenberg, whatever content decisions I put in there, say if I say that I want that, that, that button to be, to be blue or, or if, I want to, if I want to change the, the font color, it's just immediately there. This, this to me is true WYSIWYG um, in, its, in, its, in its grandest fashion. And that, it, and that, in, in that feedback loop I've, I've found is a lot shorter. But we will have to really examine that side by side with the page builders that you're working with, and really see, um, and really see how how quick that uh, that feedback loop is uh, is being addressed. And, and Jim, I'll beg to differ with you on that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I answer this? Like, well, 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 yeah, well, there's nobody. I, didn't, I'm not, uh, I just the, the point is it's quite simple. <laughs> When you're working with Gutenberg like any admin, you have to connect your style sheet with the admin. The, develop, the developer needs to do that for you, or you have to do it for yourself. Then you will get a true WYSIWYG. Right now, when you go to an editor, you're not seeing exactly it if the editing style sheets are not loaded in the admin. It's a simple process. It's one line of code in your function. You use Gutenberg out of the box without adding that. Portion, so that's why you're not seeing true WYSIWYG. And as far as saving blocks, there's a button right there saying make usable block. So you can create right there in Gutenberg a reusable block, and that's available. And the big difference is I think that the philosophy in Gutenberg is to create a out-of-the-box experience for new users. WordPress has to compete with Squarespace and Weebly and all that sort of stuff. And Gutenberg is meant to become an out-of-the-box experience including Gutenberg, which is a simple, integrated, and completely uh, 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 native experience. Adding Beaver Builder or whatever, all those builders is, a, is, a, is, a, is an add-on. WordPress has to compete in this universe, and that's why Gutenberg is there. That's about it. I like that. <laughs> all right, so it's, uh, it's uh, loaded. John, thank you for your talk. I'd like to uh, mention to everyone here that we have some wonderful sponsors. I think they were in your presentation. Yes, now. they are. Bring it up. So Alex is over there, first in the first in the list. So thank you, Alex. Just want to make sure that uh, you get a chance to visit the sponsors and say hi, introduce yourself, get to know the people in the community. The sponsors obviously are they're, they're almost at every word camp. Some of the sponsors that are here are everywhere and. Uh, they have a lot of interesting insights uh, as to not just selling their own products, but also the people there are truly part of the community and have been for many years. And so they have a lot of wisdom to impart. So we hope that you stop by. Every time you go between the sessions, they're right there in the, in the hall. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.